All right. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, it's an honor for us to have here today uh, Professor Randall Knight in our colloquium. He's a professor emeritus of physics at California Polytechnic State University. He, he got his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. He, he had a postdoc at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. He has held faculty positions at the Ohio State University, the California Polytechnic State University. He's now a fellow of the American Physical Society, also a fellow of the American Association of Physics Teachers. Uh, he has authored research papers in atomic physics and laser spectroscopy. And well, uh, especially here in UFI, he's very well known for his textbook in, in fundamental physics that we use here in our institute for, for our uh, introductory physics courses. It's the um, how, uh, uh, physics for scientists and engineers, a strategic approach. So we, we are very happy to have you here. Professor, thank you very much for accepting our invitation, especially because it's really early there. It's, it's like 6 a.m. there for Professor Knight. So that was very kind of you for accepting our invitation. Please you can share a screen and thank you for it again. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you. Of course, it would be much more fun if I were there in Rio, but uh, fortunately we can do these things virtually these days. So let me try again, see if we can get the screen sharing going. Okay, are you seeing that all right? Yes, yes. Okay, very good. So I want to thank Professor Pereira for uh, translating these into Portuguese for me so that we can have a bilingual uh, presentation here because I know some of you speak English very well, but some of you, particularly students, may not so well. So this way, hopefully, everybody can follow along. So. Physics education research is a field of physics that's now about 40 years old. And the goal of physics education research is to understand how students learn physics. Uh, you know, what are the challenges? What obstacles do they face when they learn physics? Uh, and this is research carried out, it's, it's in many ways, this kind of psychology research, how do, how do people learn, but it's carried out by physicists because it requires a very detailed content knowledge of the subject to be able to really probe deeply into how students learn physics. And it's particularly important for teaching physics as well because of the fact that we want our methods of teaching physics to be matched to how students learn physics. If, if our teaching methods are not matched to how students actually learn physics, then the, the effectiveness of the teaching is probably not going to be very good. So I should say that I am not a research re researcher. I've never done any physics education research. I'm an educator and a textbook writer, but I have followed this field very closely for almost 40 years now uh, because I want my textbooks, as well as my teaching methods, to be informed by research in order to be, be as effective as possible. So what I'm going to try to do in this talk is summarize this 40 years of physics education research. As I see it, you know, what are some of the, the major findings? What have we learned in these 40 years about how do people learn physics? Uh, and particularly also then, what are the implications for how we should be teaching physics, mostly at the introductory level? Some, some of the things I have to say will apply also to teaching more advanced courses. And there is a whole area of, of people who do research into more ad, advanced courses, such as how do students learn quantum mechanics. But I'm going to be focused primarily on, on introductory physics. Uh, this talk is really aimed primarily at faculty members that teach introductory physics uh, because of the, the implications occasions of teaching, uh, but if there are students here, I think you'll find this interesting also. I'm going to make quite a bit of distinction between novices or beginners, who are the students in introductory physics, uh, versus experts, 
who are generally physics faculty members, students are kind of an interesting case because you're in a transition state. You still have some ideas that are not very different from novices, even though you may not realize it, but you're also beginning to pick up more expert ways of thinking as well. So, so students are kind of an in-between type of case. So with that, I think a very important first thing to notice is that your students are not like you or me. It's very common when we teach, or when we, when we do anything for that matter, and if we see anybody that's you know, having a hard time understanding something or struggling, we think about what our own experiences were. You know, what, what did I struggle with with physics? What helped me? But it turns out though that we are not typical students. We're way out on the edge of the bell curve somewhere in terms of kind of math and, and science ability, or we wouldn't be physics professors and, and have advanced degrees in physics now. So what worked for us when we studied physics is not necessarily good advice to the typical student in your class. I don't know what the statistics are in Brazil, but in the, in the United States, only about one in perhaps 200 students in an introductory physics class at the university you might think of as more or less like younger versions of you or me in the sense that they're eventually going to get an advanced degree in, in physics or some other type of related science. Uh, the corollary, of course, if only one in 200 students is more or less like you or me is that 99.5% are not. And so trying to relate our experience where we had difficulties or what we found easy in learning physics to, to, more, to the more typical student is usually not going to be very effective. What we need to do instead, and this is where the physics education research comes in, is there's now a vast body of literature on what a more typical student really does struggle with um, and, and where the challenges for them are. So we need to kind of pay attention to that literature and that research to help us understand the students that we teach. So you know, kind of there in summary, you know, our experience is probably not very relevant to the challenges that face the large majority of our students. One of the very earliest parts of physics education research and going on until this day is recognizing and studying the, the fact that students have a vast number of misconceptions about physics, conceptual errors. And you can probe these by asking them conceptual questions and seeing how they respond. Now, it's not that they're just mistakes. I mean, they are mistakes, but in some ways, their misconceptions are a coherent set of ideas that they can use to reason with or to make predictions. It just turns out that they're wrong ideas. And in many cases, these misconceptions are very resistant to change. You can go and I'll, I'll show you some evidence of that, but they can go long ways through taking an introductory physics class and you may think they're learning and they may be learning how to do numerical problem solving with pushing numbers around on a piece of paper, but their conceptions of what is going on physically may not be changing. So, and it's particularly important to realize that students do not change how they think simply because you tell them the correct way. The, the, they'll, they'll listen to you, they'll write it down in their notes, but it doesn't change what they're actually thinking. This is one of the very earliest cases of physics education research. This is probably from 1978 or 1979. A study with, that was done at the University of Massachusetts. This was in a, in a typical introductory physics class that uses calculus for scientists and engineers. And on the very first day of class, before they had studied anything, they asked students several conceptual questions. So in this particular question, they showed them a little picture, which I've shown here. This is exactly the picture they used. They said a coin gets tossed up in the air at A, and it's going to be caught at C. So at point B, while the coin's going up, just draw some arrows showing the direction of every force that's acting on the coin at B. Now, I should note that in the, in the United States, right, since our educational structure is a little bit different than some other countries, uh, 
Almost all students that take a calculus-based introductory physics course at the university took a high school physics course, usually 90% or more. So for almost all of these students, they have had high school physics. Never, nevertheless, when asked this on the first day, only 12% of students gave a satisfactory correct answer. Now, what, what do we think a correct answer is? Well, we might say this is kind of the desired Newtonian answer, that is the coins going up, the only force acting on it is gravity. Now, if they said something about air resistance, we would actually give them bonus points for that. So they weren't marked wrong because they forgot little minor forces like a slight bit of buoyancy or air resistance. No, instead, here's the response that you get from the large majority of students. Yes, gravity acts down, but there's also an upward force of the throw. Now, they may call this by different names, the force of your hand, the force of motion, the force of the throw. But one way or another, the large majority of students feel quite confident that there has to be an upward force or else the coin would not be moving upward. Now, of course, this was on the first day of, of class. They're going to spend an entire semester doing almost nothing but Newtonian mechanics. So what's going to happen if you put this exact same question on the final exam 14 or 15 weeks later? And interestingly, I might ask you to make a prediction as to how well you would think they would do at, at the end of a semester of mechanics. But here's the answer. 25% answered it correctly an entire semester later. Now, in, in English, there's an expression of, of talking about whether you see a glass is half empty or half full. If you would like to see the glass is half full, you might say, oh, there was a 100% increase in, in, in the success rate. And how often do you see 100% increases? So and I guess in, in that way, uh, that's kind of good. But at the same time, it's really important to remember that at a major American university, after an entire semester of Newtonian mechanics, 75% of students still cannot answer this most basic question about the nature of forces. So that tells us that something serious is going on. Now, of course, we have our laws of motion, Newton's laws of motion, which are the ones that we want students to learn and to apply. Interestingly, though, after decades now of studying how students think about forces and, and their answers to many, many conceptual questions like this, we can re recognize that there are essentially student laws of motion. And they have three, just like Newton. The first law of motion says, if there's no force on an object, the object is at rest or will immediately come to rest. But the converse is not true. Simply because an object is rest at rest, does not imply that there is no net force. So in other words, it takes a force to keep an object moving, according to students, and it will stop if there are no forces. But if you ask students, say, well, there's, here's a book sitting on the table. Why doesn't the book fall? We might want them to say, well, because the table exerts an upward normal force on it, there's no net force. But that's not how most students will reply. They'll, they'll agree that there's a force of gravity. But when you say, well, why doesn't it fall? Well, simply the table's in the way. They don't think of that as a force. It's just something that's preventing gravity from causing it to fall. The second law of motion for students is that motion requires a force. And that's what we saw in this question about the coin toss. Active agents give a force of motion to an object that causes the object to continue to move even after that active agent is removed. So as you through the coin upward or throw a ball upward, something about the force of your hand sticks to the object and continues with that object. And eventually it wears down. It doesn't last forever. And as it wears down, and, and you, you, if you probe students, you'll find that this is the way most of them think, you know, it's that upward force of motion or force of the throw kind of wears off. Then eventually the object reaches its highest point. And it, when it, as it's falling back down, they will usually tell you that indeed gravity is the only force as it's falling back down. And then finally, when two objects interact, the larger or perhaps more massive object wins. They, they, see this, they see this as a contest and the larger object wins by exerting a larger force on the smaller object. This is kind of a classic case of the mosquito running into the windshield of a car. 
And if you ask students, you know, which exerts the larger force on the other, you'll find typically 80 or 90% of students will say, well, it's perfectly obvious that the car exerts a larger force on the mosquito than vice versa. Now, if you ask students, do you know Newton's third law? They almost all do. They can tell you for every action, there's an equal but opposite reaction. But simply because they know the words doesn't mean that they have ever internalized that and can think with that idea. If you don't mention Newton's third law and just give them a, a question and say, you know, which exerts the larger force, almost all of them will say that the larger object exerts the larger force. So there's a very much of a disconnect between what they can say, what they've memorized from the book or from your class versus how they actually think about physical situations. This is not limited to mechanics. Here's an example from electricity from the, from the University of Washington. Again, a calculus-based course for scientists and engineers. They're being asked a circuit question. They, they don't have to know anything about being able to understand a circuit diagram because you can see the actual picture of a battery and two light bulbs that are glowing. At the moment, they're in series, but we're gonna close a switch. And the question is, when you close the switch, what happens to the brightness of these two bulbs? And so same kind of setup. They first gave the students to the, this will be a second semester topic. So on the first day of second semester, they, they give the students this question and only 15% can answer it correctly. <clears throat> uh, by far the most common response is that bulb E does get dimmer, although it does not go out and nothing at all happens to bulb D. It's, at, it's completely unchanged. And again, they put the same exact question on the final exam. Did we get 100% gain this time? Well, unfortunately, no. There was no change at all. On the final exam, still only 15% could answer it correctly and 85% answer it wrong. Now, in physics, we have circuit laws. We have Kirchhoff's laws of current and, and the loop law and the junction law and so on. And, and again, you know, students have their laws of circuits that you can learn by probing a lot of their, with a lot of questions, how they think about these conceptual situations. What's a battery? To students, a battery is a source of constant and unchanging current. No matter what the circuit is, the battery always provides the same current. This is, you, you may not realize that students think this unless you've really asked them these kinds of questions. This is extremely widespread. It's a very, very difficult idea to get students to change. Current gets used up as it moves through a circuit. So if you have several elements in series, the first element gets more current, the second one gets a little less, the third one a little less, and so on. This is an easier idea to change, but most students come in with this idea. And finally, if there's a junction anywhere in the circuit, the current divides equally. 50% goes each direction. And you can see the first and third of these is why they answered this question the way they did. <clears throat> when you close the switch, what does that do? Well, the battery, what's the battery? The battery is a source of constant and unchanging current. All that current goes through D, so closing the switch has nothing to do with the current going through D, and so it's unchanged. But now with the switch closed, there's a junction. What happens at the junction? 50% goes each way. So bulb E still gets half the current that it had before, enough to make it dimmer, but not enough to make it go out. So it's important to recognize that there's some coherence to the way students think. It's not just random thoughts, but it's not, the, it's not the conceptual understanding that we want them to have or that we think is consistent with experimental evidence. <clears throat> Another very important finding is what psychologists particularly like to call the diff difference between experts and novices. Students in introductory physics are novices or beginners and physics professors are experts. And it's not that the novices are just kind of, they make a, maybe make a few more stakes so they can't work quite as quickly. Novices and experts actually think about the subject in very different ways. 
Well, the, and, and the issue of novices and experts has been studied by cognitive psychologists in, in many areas over many decades. So this is not anything specific to understanding physics students. One of the classic experiments, and this is probably from the 1960s, I, can't, I don't even know when this was first done, was done with chess players. They took a group of people who knew the rules of chess, but were total beginners, and a group of chess grandmasters. And they set up a chess board with the, all the pieces taken from the middle of a game. So maybe you know half the pieces have already been removed and half are still there, but it's from an actual game. And they asked the subjects to look at the board for maybe 10 seconds. Then they cover up the board and say, OK, now reproduce as much of the board as you can. <clears throat> And not surprisingly, the novices can't do it at all. They can maybe put two or three pieces out correctly, but that's it. A grandmaster, after having just seen the board for 10 seconds, will always set it up perfectly, no mistakes. So what's the difference? And the difference is how you, what, what psychologists say, can combine or, or information in your mind, your working memory called chunks. Experts utilize bigger chunks of information, and that allows you to keep a lot more information in mind at once. You probably know that your short-term memory or your, or your working memory can only hold five or six or seven items at a time. And if you see every chess piece and every square of the chessboard as a different piece of information, you can't possibly remember everything that you need to, to, to put the board back together after having only seen it for a few seconds. But chess experts, grandmasters, <clears throat> they recognize large groups of pieces as related to each other. And that's simply one chunk of information to them. And so it allows them to quickly grasp what's going on with a very brief glimpse at the board. Likewise, think about a physics problem. A physics problem really has, even at the introductory level, a lot of information from what's the situation, what are the quantities, what are the initial conditions, what are you being asked? Far more than information that you can keep in working memory. And so beginners quickly fall apart. They can't keep, 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 keep track of what's going on in a problem. Whereas an expert, when you look at this, you go immediately, oh, I see that A, B, and C are all related to conservation of momentum. So you, you, you're chunking the problem in big chunks and the beginners not. So, so you really think about the subjects in very different ways than the beginners. And it's important to recognize and remember that when you're trying to solve sample problems and help beginners learn problem solving is they're thinking about the problem very differently than you are. And you need to get yourself back into kind of a novice way of thinking about things. This has often been described in terms of what are called knowledge structures. How is information organized in your brain? So let's take Newtonian mechanics for an example. If you're an expert, you've got this very organized hierarchical way of thinking about Newton's laws or Newtonian mechanics. So you start with some very broad general principles, Newton's laws or conservation laws. And then that can be broken down to a lower level and then yet a lower level. And then finally, uh, so, you know, the various details about a problem, which really are nothing but details, but don't have any, anything to do with the fundamental laws. So if you're given a problem that you've never seen before for an introductory problem, you immediately know how to solve it. You just read it. You go, I know this how to solve this because immediately you recognize that, oh, maybe I need to use the second law, or maybe this is a conservation of energy problem. It just occurs to you without even really realizing that you're automatically analyzing this problem just as you read it based upon your organized and very hierarchical knowledge structure of Newtonian mechanics. But what happens when a novice reads the same problem? What kind of knowledge structure do they have? It's something more like this. It's just kind of random pieces of information with random connections. There's no overall organization. It's just things here and there they memorized. 
there's, there's lots of research that show that students really focus on what we call the surface features of a problem, like not that this is a new conservation of energy problem or a Newton second law problem, but it's an inclined plane problem. That's how they classify them, uh, you know, regardless of how we, we ultimately would, would want them to solve it. So if your information is organized in your head this way, what are you going to do with a, with a problem when you see it on an exam? You're just going to kind of struggle. You're not going to have an organized way of trying to approach the problem. Now, of course, knowledge structures can be changed, and that's what we want students to be doing as they take our physics classes. But it's not an easy or quick process to change knowledge structures. I'll come back to some of these things a little bit later. But using expert-like problem-solving strategies, giving them appropriate types of exercises and homeworks where they're not just kind of spinning their wheels. All those things slowly but surely can help change, students change their knowledge structure. <sighs> now, physics has been traditionally taught as a lecture. The professor stands up in front of the class, lectures, writes on the blackboard, and the students just quietly sit and take notes. Uh, and we often call this traditional instruction. And it, of course, is still the, the main mode of instruction at many universities all around the world. But one of the things that has come out of physics education research is the idea of active learning. And I'll have more to say later about some of the techniques of active learning. But the main distinction is that students are actively engaged during the process and not just quietly and passively sitting there and taking notes while the professor is the only one that's that's actually active. And what we discover is that on these types of conceptual questions like the coin toss, like you know the circuit picture and, and many, many, many other types of conceptual questions is that students who learn physics in an active learning environment learn a lot more conceptual understanding double at least, sometimes triple or more, the, the amount of gain that you see from a traditional lecture-based instruction. Now, part of that, of course, is because active learning often gives a lot more emphasis to qualitative and conceptual understanding than a traditional lecture class does. And so if you spend more time talking about conceptual issues, then of course, it's not surprising that students may come to understand conceptual physics better at the same time, though, people are, are worried or concerned that, well, if you're spending more time on conceptual problems, you're spending less time on problem solving and quantitative analysis. And so students are probably going to their, their gains in conceptual understanding might be balanced by losses in their ability to, to solve problems. And ultimately, of course, in physics, we judge a student's success by their ability to solve problems. But the interesting finding now from many universities over many years is that even though you spend less time in an active learning class on problem solving, it does not hurt their problem solving performance. It's still just as good as it is with traditional lecture based instruction. So it seems to be, and perhaps this really isn't surprising, that a good conceptual understanding is actually a requirement for being able to solve quantitative problems for anything other than the just very most basic problems where you can just plug numbers into a formula. If you have to actually, you know, reason your way through a, a, a quantitative problem, you have to have that conceptual understanding as a basis for, for doing so. And I'll, I'll say a bit more about this in a minute. Now, of course, we do want to teach problem solving. Uh, and it's not easy for students to learn but because of these issues with, with knowledge structure, misconceptions, and so on. But a lot is known about problem solving. It could really be the basis of a whole talk unto itself. So I'm, I'm not going to have a whole lot to say about how to teach problem solving. But I will note that certainly something professors told me when I was a student, when I was beginning as an assistant professor to teach something I would tell students this how, how do you get ready for an exam well just solve lots and lots of problems and actually it turns out that that's not necessarily very good advice for most students because most students have very bad habits about problem solving and what are you doing when you solve lots and lots of problems you're just reinforcing the bad habits and you're not necessarily developing any, any better habits just from lots of, of practice so Practice needs to be more structured. It's what in, in learning circles is sometimes called deliberate practice as opposed to just random practice. 
And part of that starts in class with how you solve example problems in class. Students need to see example problem, example problem solving from an expert-like perspective. Now, what does that mean? When you do a sample problem in class, typically, you know, you, you, you'll put the problem on the board or show it on, on, on the screen or read it out loud, however you do it. And then you'll start writing down some equations and, and doing things on the board. But because of your expert-like knowledge structure, you're already halfway through to the solution in your mind before you even write the first thing down. And students don't see this. So you're going to go, well, we're going to use conservation of energy to solve this problem. But in the student mind, the question is, how did you know that you could solve this problem by using conservation of energy? So expert like problem solving, you need to talk out loud about your thought processes, things that are so second nature to you that, that you don't really think about them consciously anymore, but you need as, as, as a teacher, to get back to being able to see it from a student's perspective and, and, and not just, you know, immediately use your big chunking of information, but say, you know, as I read this problem, what's telling me that I can use conservation of energy here? So those are the types of things that you need to try to convey to students is to say, you know, I'm an expert, but why am I seeing this as an expert? What's in the problem statement that, that allows me to see this? Then, what do you have students do to practice? Not, not, and we don't now just won't go lots and lots of problems. The best thing we can do is give them structured practice, what people often call scaffolding, where the first few problems that they solve on a topic have lots of hints. And they may not necessarily need to use the hints, but the hints are there if, if they need them. And then as they go along, there are less hints and then less hints. And then finally, almost no hints. So it's like they have a scaffolding, but bit by bit, the scaffolding is taken down as they get more and more practice. Problem solving requires actually many individual skills when you stop and think about it. And those can be isolated and practiced individually. I often like to use the example of, of sports. If, if somebody wants to play basketball, you don't just immediately send them out to, to play a full game you realize that there are many different skills involved in playing basketball. And when you go to basketball practice, you practice those skills one at a time. So if you want to solve mechanics problems, you need to be able to identify forces and draw a free body diagram. And those are skills that you can practice by isolating them, not to solve a full problem, but say, you know, here's a situation. What are the forces? Draw a free body diagram. Here's another situation. What are the forces? Draw a free body diagram. So think about the different ways that you can focus on helping students learn the skills that, that you can do in a pretty quick and rapid process and they'll later need those skills for actual problem solving. And then you would really like students to get immediate feedback. I mean, if you're you know, practicing basketball, the coach is going to be right there with you and giving you feedback on how to how to change the way you shoot the basketball or how you do this and so on. So that you can reuse that immediately and change as you're going. If you collect homework and give back graded homework a week later, students have completely forgotten what the problems were. Getting feedback a week later is, is of absolutely no benefit to the student in trying to learn what they did wrong. So look for ways that you can give immediate feedback as students do this skill and problem solving practice. I often hear from my own colleagues about how, well, students can't solve physics problems because their math skills are so bad. Well, it's true that students are, are sometimes weak in mathematics, but that's not really why they can't solve physics problems. And in fact, most of the places in mathematics that they're weak or not because they didn't learn math, but things that they weren't taught in math classes because we do things differently in physics. So most students have really never studied much about vectors in math classes. Or if they did, mathematicians think of vectors as triples of numbers. They don't think of them in a physical sense as a magnitude and a direction. So they, they come into physics not ever having really studied anything about vectors. So of course, they're not gonna be very good unless we help them. Uh, we use proportional reasoning a lot in, in, in physics, 
Uh, that's not something they teach in math. We have to help them learn those skills. And they're just learning calculus as they take introductory physics. So they may be able to, if you give them a derivative or an integral, you know, kind of work it out as a math problem. But, but thinking how to apply those as a useful reasoning tool for summation or dividing things up or slopes, that's still something that they need a lot of help with. So it's not that their math is bad, it's just that we want them to use math in a different way than they've learned it in their math classes, and we need to help them do that. And so, yes, they do make mistakes, but the reason that students can't solve physics problems is usually that they don't understand the physics and therefore didn't set the problem up correctly to begin with. So if, if you can't identify the forces correctly and can't draw a free body diagram, you're not going to solve a mechanics problem correctly, no matter how good your math skills are. Um, this is something that's been significant to me for increasingly so over the last number of years, and that's that students are not familiar with the phenomena that physics is trying to explain. Now, if you stop and think about it, you know, physics, I mean, yes, we're using mathematical theories, but we're trying to give an explanation as to things that actually happen. And if you don't know what happens, what good is the theory? And it turned, with mechanics, it's not too bad. I mean, students have already spent their life until they get to the university moving objects, moving their own bodies. They have lots and lots of misconceptions, but at least they know the phenomena. They understand that we're trying to come up with an explanation of what's the connection between force and motion. But when you go beyond mechanics, students' uh, knowledge or familiarity with the even the most basic phenomena is very, very poor. What do students come in knowing about electricity? They know how to change batteries. They know that light switches turn lights on and off. And that's almost all they know about electricity. And if we start out writing down integrals for how to find electric fields or tell them about, about Gauss's law, I mean, they may be able to, to do this as a math problem, but it's, it's irrelevant to them because they don't know what we're trying to explain. They don't know the physics behind the theory because they've never had this, these experiences before. So one really important thing we can do is give students an opportunity to see and experience actual physical phenomena uh, so they know what the theory is trying to explain. One way to do that is we using lots and lots of lecture demonstrations. Now, in the, in the US, most physics departments have a very good collection of large experiments that can be set out in lecture for demonstrating things. I know, I don't know about Brazil. I know in Europe, lecture demonstrations are not so common. So this changes a lot around the world as to, to how much people think lecture demonstrations are important and, and what equipment they have available for doing this. But, but let me urge you to make lecture demonstrations a really big part of showing students what we're trying to explain or what we need to explain with our theories. Uh, another place you can do this is in laboratories. We tend to, in laboratories, emphasize formal data analysis, you know, learn, learn to calculate those means and standard deviations and things like that. But that's kind of a pointless exercise if students didn't understand what the physics was of, of the measurements that they took. So rather than you know, lots of measurements, use lab time more informally, or at least at the beginning of laboratories, to simply observe what happens. So you know, if I set this up, what's, what's it going to do? If I change something, what, what's going to happen? What happens if I do this or if I move this over there? You know, Just use laboratory time to let students become familiar with the phenomena that our theories are going to try to explain for them. And because we're all trying to make better science education, it's really important to recognize that changing anything, including science education, is a long, slow process. It doesn't happen quickly uh, because we have to change the university, we have to change the way we think, we have to change the way we think, we teach. So none of this happens quickly or, or overnight. There was one survey a few years ago in the US 70% of university physics faculty say, well, yes, they actually would be interested in using the results of physics education. And nearly half said they had even tried 
one research-based teaching strategy. If you know Eric Mazur's little book called Peer Instruction, that's very widely known in, in the United States. And so using peer instruction is by far the most common thing that, that nearly half of physics professors said they had tried. So that sounds fairly promising, but if you probe these professors a little bit deeper on the survey, you discover that many, many of them that had tried to use a research-based teaching strategy did not do it correctly. They really didn't understand how it should be done. And so therefore they didn't get very good results and they probably didn't, didn't continue it because it didn't work out for them. But it didn't work out not so much because the students didn't like it, but because they didn't understand it themselves and didn't implement it correctly. And not surprising, you know, professors are busy people. You know, it's, so many say, well, I, I might like to teach better, but I, I simply don't have time to learn new ways of teaching. So changing instructional practices is complex, it's slow, and it does take some time and effort. That's, that's why, in, you know, in a talk like this, and in, I, I try to summarize, you know, that we know a lot about how students learn, but instructors need to take some time and effort to, to learn that themselves so that it can influence how they teach. So quite a number of years ago, probably 15 years ago by now, I tried to put a lot of this information together into a little booklet called Five Easy Lessons, Strategies for Successful Physics Teaching. Uh, and this is published by Pearson, the same publisher that publishes my textbooks. Uh, they often will just give this away to, for free to, to physics professors. So I'm, I'm going to ask my editor to, to, to send you a few copies so that you'll have to look at this. Uh, but it, it goes into a lot more detail, but it's, it's many of the things that I'm telling you here today. So one really important thing, though, in any type of, of teaching of introductory classes is to have realistic expectations. These are beginning students in our classes, even yes, if they studied it in high school a little bit, they're still beginning students at the university. And we're not going to, with one year of instruction, turn them into experts. They're not going to be professional scientists or engineers after one year. So we can definitely help them. We can move them along in the process, but, but don't be unrealistic in thinking that they're going to be experts after a mere year of physics instruction. So by far the most important lesson is the idea of active learning, to keep students actively engaged and to give them rapid feedback on their work. <clears throat> so there are many tools of active learning in, in, in the Five Easy Lessons book. It goes into more details about each of these. Uh, some work better in, in small classes. Some work perfectly well in very large lecture halls. Uh, so, so there's a lot of variety, but the key thing is that in all of them, the students are actively engaged and they're not just passively taking notes as they listen to you talk. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you never lecture or that they're actively engaged the whole time. You, you need a balance. In many cases, a lot, of, a lot of professors that use active learning will give what they call a five or 10 minute mini lecture. Just you know, quickly summarize a few key things and then branch into some student activities using that information. And they'll maybe cycle through this two or three times in, a, in an hour long class. Uh, by far the most commonly used method of active engagement is peer instruction, where you pose a question, a conceptual question usually, not, not a, just a problem, to the class and ask students to simply talk with their neighbors, their peers, about it. Sometimes you'll ask, might ask them to answer first what they think themselves, then ask them to discuss it with a neighbor and, and then ask again to see if they still have the same answer or a different answer, maybe like in, in the coin toss question. And you might think, well, if they don't know that anything themselves, how can talking to themselves improve their learning? And the reason it works is that students actually do have many ideas. Some are right, some are wrong. They're not well structured. Simply the process of talking about it helps them structure their ideas better. And in talking, it brings out, and some of them, an answer they might give initially that was would be wrong, if they just talk about it with their neighbor for a minute, they might go, well, that doesn't sound right. I'm not sure that's really true at all. So just talking about it and articulating it sometimes gets them to realize themselves that that's not right. And then they're looking for a better explanation. 
So it's surprising how much learning there can be in peer-to-peer -peer interaction, uh, just kind of putting together the, the, the pieces that they're beginning to pick up on their own. Uh, if you have recitations or problem solving sessions, those are a good time, not just to go through rote homework problems, but to use those for tutorials, worksheets. There's lots of things that are available that can be used. One of my favorites is what we call interactive lecture demonstrations. So even if you do lecture demonstrations, we often tend to do them in a way that's not very good from a teaching perspective. There's something set out on the table and we, we do a little demonstration and say there, gee, wasn't that interesting. Now, you may have, have done this many times, but the student has never seen this before so that they don't even know what the apparatus is that you're using and, and they don't know what the possible outcomes might be. So it's, it's maybe entertaining, but there's a lot of research that shows that if you ask them a week later, they won't remember that you ever did this. But it takes almost no effort to change it where they will remember, and that's to make it interactive. And by that, I mean, first, slow down, take some time to actually explain the apparatus, because remember, you know what it is, but they've never seen it before. Say, so, you know, here's this apparatus, it does the following things, and here's what I'm going to do. But before doing it, say, I want you to predict what's going to happen. Now, you can do this in various ways. You could have them write it on a piece of paper and hand it in. Uh, if you have any kind of classroom response system, you know, what people often call clickers or something like that, you could, you, you could, that's a, a fast and easy way to collect information. You might give them some multiple choice options of things that might happen um, and so on. And only then do the demonstration. Now, why is that important? We're playing on basic human psychology. If you just do the demonstration, students don't care. If you ask them to make a prediction, now they do. Because everybody, it's just psychology, once you've made a prediction, now you want to know if your prediction was right or wrong. And you're gonna pay close attention and you're gonna remember. And so there's a lot of research showing that a lot of these conceptual gains can be made by, by doing the coin toss or this, this, the light bulb types of things as interactive lecture demonstrations, make students make a prediction, which will then usually be a wrong prediction. And then they'll go, oh, I was wrong, why? And then if you, you spend you know, the follow-up time, well, why did a lot of you make a wrong prediction? That weeks later, they will remember that and they'll be able to give the right answer when they see it again. So interactive lecture demonstrations are very, very powerful. Uh, again, as I mentioned, you know, students don't know the phenomena for the most part. So, so give a lot of focus on phenomena, lecture demonstrations, labs, wherever you have the opportunity to do so. And particularly important in introductory classes is start with concrete things. You know, in teaching physics, we have a tendency to try to write down a general principle and then derive the consequences. Now, that may be perfectly appropriate for teaching a graduate class, because in a graduate class, the implication is, well, the physics is pretty well known. Now we need to develop all the mathematical formalisms. But for beginners, that doesn't work at all. So for beginners, we want to be much more inductive with lots of concrete examples and only then saying, well, what kind of more abstract ideas can we draw from these concrete examples? Students have all these misconceptions or is it sometimes called alternative conceptions and you have to deal with those because those are getting in the way of their learning. But so how can you do that? Well, one, one way is to elicit the misconceptions by asking them conceptual questions in class, by using interactive lecture demonstrations. You know, get students to bring up their misconception. Then you can confront the misconception once it's out in the open. Again, you know, a lecture demonstration is a really good way of doing that. And then you have to resolve it, saying, well, your prediction didn't work. Why not? What's, what's a better way of thinking about this that would have made a correct prediction? And then do it again and do it again and do it again. Again, human psychology. What happens if you're wrong on something? You tend to rationalize it, you know, try to justify, well, that was a trick question. 
or well, I would have been right if it had been you know something different over here. So we we, we tend to not want to accept that we made a made an incorrect thing and look for a better explanation. We want to try to justify why we were incorrect. So you have to do this over and over again until students really real begin to realize that their mental models are not ever giving the right predictions but you're giving them a different way of thinking about it that does give the right predictions. Uh, again, I noted, you know, we could talk all day about problem solving, but, you know, develop the skills in isolation, help students organize their knowledge. And then ultimately, what do you test them on, on exam problems? Students are really, really good after the very first exam of knowing what kind of exam questions you're going to write, and that's all they're going to study for. So you could talk all day in class about the importance of conceptual understanding, but if you don't put conceptual questions on your exams, then students aren't going to be hearing you. So you need a balance of both conceptual, qualitative types of assessment along with quantitative problem solving, or else students won't take the conceptual understanding seriously and, and pay attention to thinking about it. So. Thank you very much for listening to this. I hope I was useful to you and gave you some ideas. And I think we've got a little bit of time here for, for, for questions, if I can get out of my sharing. There we go. All right. Thank you, Professor, for the, this nice talk. We're open for questions. People want to ask questions. They may raise their hands or just write on the chat. And of course, they can write in Portuguese if they want. It's, it's, it's fine. You can translate. So please, Marco. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you, Professor Knight. That was a very nice and clear talk. So um, I th I'm sure we will we'll be able to to take a lot home from from this. Maybe we should take an exam at the end, <laughs> like just to see how much we learned about it. But <clears throat> pardon me, I have a, a, just a couple of questions. Uh, one is. Sometimes I wonder if you know teaching mechanics and kinematics as I mean, as the first course is the best thing because you know uh, we are confronting uh, sort of a lifetime of experience against um, uh, a new level of abstraction and and mathematical tools. So there is a huge conflict. Wouldn't it? Is it possible, some maybe, to consider? The idea of teaching something that's far removed from uh, from the daily experience to learn how to think about um, uh, nature physically and mathematically, and then maybe go back to to the more the more um, the more sort of a daily experience. So this is one question, and a, a second question I would like to ask you is. Um, when we teach, like sometimes we, we teach certain tools or certain ideas, and then we ask questions, and the students like immediately start thinking about these questions with the tools they just learned. Um, that becomes like a, a sort of a very restrictive um, uh, way of thinking because it's like if you am on a chapter on collisions, whatever problem I have to solve will be using you know um, momentum conservation and so on. So how do we get out of this sort of uh, causality between what we are teaching and what we are asking them in, a, in the best possible way. So those are the two questions. Thank you very much again. Oh, thank you. Yeah, those are very interesting questions. I, I think you could very easily make a case that Newtonian mechanics is, a, is perhaps one of the worst ways to, to start introductory physics uh, because it gets right into a lot of abstractions. It gets into you're dealing with the fact that students do have so many misconceptions in mechanics because they, as I've noted, you know, they've spent their lives moving things and those misconceptions get in the way. We immediately want them to start using, you know, vectors and calculus and things that they're struggling with mathematically. And people have tried over the years to do a number of different ways. Uh, a, a relatively simple change is to start with conservation laws because mathematically they're easier. You don't need all the vectors. Uh, there have been people suggested that you should start with optics. Um, you can, you know, teach some physical reasoning and how to approach problems in, in a fairly simple subject, geometric optics, um, and so on. And it's not something that students bring all the misconceptions with because they've never really seen much of this before. 
I'm, I'm even though there were, there was one guy about 20 years ago that started out trying to teach relativity and simple quantum mechanics, you know, you know going, well, I'm going to start with something the students don't know anything about so they don't have any misconceptions at all. But the problem is, as physicists, we're extremely conservative. And while there have been, you know, people who in their own individual classes have been fairly successful at starting with teaching things other than Newtonian mechanics, if you try to get anybody else to adopt it, they won't. They'll go, oh, physics always starts with Newton's laws, and I'm not going to consider anything else. So I, I know that you know, from, from focus groups and interviews and things we've done with regard to my own textbooks, you know, we'll often ask people, would you consider any other way of ordering the topics? And they'll say, no, it has to be this way. So, so we, we, we kind of, if, as physicists, think that it's, it's kind of like the Ten Commandments. You know, Moses brought these to us, this table of contents to us on stone tablets, and it's impossible to change it. So, yes, I, I, I think it's possible that a different order could be pedagogically very good, but we, it, we've discovered it's just impossible to get people to change. Uh, with regard to your second question, yeah, students, you know, see things very narrowly. It's, it's very hard to get beyond the boundary of the current chapter. Uh, so, so you're right, you know, if it's, if it's the momentum chapter, if you ask them anything that has where they need to use energy, in addition, they, they, they just fall apart because they say, well, that's not in this chapter. So they have a very, very narrow field of view. That becomes very problematic later in the topic, for example, because when you get to motion of charged particles, you'd like them to be able to apply some things they learned in Newtonian mechanics in the context of electricity and magnetism. And they tend to now have completely forgotten anything that they learned about the motion of particles. Uh, I, I think the best you can do is, is always try to give them homework problems or exam problems or practice problems in class where, that, are, that are broader questions where you need to bring in more than one idea. You know, in, in mechanics and in, in conservation laws, you know, the, the ballistic pendulum is always a very popular one because you need to use both conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. Um, but, and students have a hard time with this because that, that requires they think about two different subjects at once. But, but any, anything that you can do to, 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 to bring in problems where they need to, to think in a broader context is good practice, but students do struggle with this there because it, it requires they think in a bigger, more holistic way, have a bigger, better knowledge structure in a sense than they typically do. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for your insights. All right, thank you. So, uh, Rodrigo. Hi, uh, Randall. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, it's, it's really nice uh, hearing from you especially because we have heard a lot of, about you from uh, from uh, one of our colleagues, which I think he was one of your colleagues, Jorge Isai Martins. I think he's over there. I guess you guys know each other for a while. Um, but I, I would like to ask you two questions. Um, very specific. One, one is very specific question that I would like to hear your opinion. And another one a little bit more general. The first one, it's very specific about the, it, it kind of follows up a little bit on the, on the point that Mark raised before me, which it regards in, to the order in which we give, you know, basic physics uh, content. So basically from what I could gather um, from all the places that I have been around the world, we usually follow traditional order mechanics and then thermodynamics and then electromagnetism and then optics in the first two years. In, uh, in re over here, we have changed that to mechanics in the first semester and then electromagnetism in the second semester. I find that a little bit, and, and that's uh, cause for a lot of discussion amongst ourselves because some people defend that and some people find that it's a little bit too soon to give uh, uh, ENM uh, basically on the second semester or third semester because it requires more advanced calculus and the students they don't have maturity yet for that. I kind of tend to agree with, the, with this point of view, but I would like to hear your thoughts on that. 
So that's my first question. And the second question is a little bit more general. You might, you might have not thought about that because this regards with uh, the physics that we teach to students, they are gonna be uh, physics teachers for, uh, for high schools. So in Brazil, it's a little bit different than in the States in, in the sense that we have basically for the undergrad, we have two physics undergrad degrees. One for, we call uh, the, the, those that are gonna follow up on grad school and gonna be researchers, and one is gonna be a physics teachers. Uh, they share some of the, the, the coursework, but uh, at some point they, they split up. And some people defend that uh, in the physics department, we should teach as much as we can, not only in terms of physics classes, but also in terms of uh, pedagogical and psychology and education and things like that in the physics department. I don't think that's productive. I, I think that all of those uh, all of those classes that are not directly related to physics should be taught in the education department. I don't know if you have come across this sort of situation, and if you have, what do you think about that? Thank you. Okay, see if I can remember all that. So first, uh, you know, again, back to the order of teaching things, it's going to how soon you can teach electricity and magnetism is going to depend a lot on your students, and also on how you correlate your physics with their math, and when they're when they're learning their math, and and, and you know different countries do, do do this differently because a lot of students are coming in to, to the university in some countries pretty good at calculus already from high school. In the U.S., that's not true. A lot of our students are only beginning calculus at the university, so. <clears throat> Our students aren't, aren't nearly far enough along in calculus that they could do the, the, the necessary calculus of electricity and magnetism by the second semester. Uh, and they struggle with it even, even if we wait till the third semester. <clears throat> but if, if your students have a good enough background, they, they might be able to do it in the second semester. So that, that's very country and, and, and institutional dependent upon whether they can do so. Uh, it's certainly true that, you know, e &M is by far the most mathematically demanding part of, of the introductory physics, um, especially if, you know, things like Gauss's law, you know, surface integrals, line integrals, well, they often don't see that until maybe a third semester of calculus. And so they, so, so they, and, and you really don't want to have to teach it your, yourself. You, you want them to kind of have that knowledge. So, so I, I don't really have a good answer to that. You just have to look at your own context as to whether that's well meshed with, with how your students are learning calculus. As far as preparing teachers, that's really, really important because if you don't have good teachers of, of science at the middle school or high school level, then you're not going to be getting good students at the university level where you see them. And so around the world, you know, it's really hard to get good high school science teachers, physics teachers. Uh, and so the, anything you can do to help that is really, really important to, for, for yourself in the long run because it, it brings students better, better prepared to your classes. Um, in, the United, in California, where I am, and this differs by state to state in, in the United States, uh, students get, that are going to be teachers get most of their pedagogy classes in the education department. And again, we, we, we do have two different ways you can major in physics. Uh, you have a, a Bachelor of Science and a Bachelor of Arts degree, and students are going to go to graduate school, get the Bachelor of Science, but the, the teachers usually get the Bachelor of Arts degree. It's a little less technically demanding, and, that, and that's fine. You don't need to know all the, the second, second semester quantum mechanics if, if you're going to be teaching high school physics and things like that, and, and they have, have some additional time then to, to take education courses. But, but we do have a, I've never taught it myself, I think it's, yes, it's a three semester, two semester long full year course on basically physics pedagogy that is taught in the physics department. So they, they, they work through a curriculum that's fairly similar to what they might teach in high school, uh, but they, they do it with a professor, so they're kind of approaching it to say, you know, how does an expert view all these? Where are the misconceptions that students are going to have? Where are, where are students going to stumble with this? So they work through it themselves, 
So they see it from the student's perspective, but then they're also discussing it with the professor from the expert's perspective of what's the pedagogy, how should we teach this, and so on. So I, I think that's really good so that they have you know, kind of you know, an expert guidance in teaching physics, because if you relegate all of that to the education college, they, they, don't, they don't know anything about physics over in the education college. And, and, and in fact, they would hold all the same misconceptions that, that students do. So, so a, a, a balance between doing this in the education college and doing it in the physics department, I think, works out pretty well. All right. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. All right. Thiago, por favor. Hi. Uh, okay. I also would like to thank you for your talk. And I mean, I have one question. I mean, so most of these methods that you, I mean, like this, like more interactive methods to teach, you usually ask the student to read the book before the class, and then you try to, to discuss what the students have read. So do you think that you should try to change the way you write the test book that is more, I mean, the, the format is for the student to read it before, because most of the test books were not taught when they were working uh, in this way. And also, I mean, I also was thinking that it, nowadays it's also pretty common that you have videos of lectures. So many teachers, instead of asking the students to read the book before the class, they ask the students to see the, the, the video, which is the professor giving a, a lecture about the, that section of the book. So do you think this is better? I mean, it's, you know, any research, I mean, I, I kind of get afraid that, I mean, you're not going to read any book anymore. No, if people just see the lectures before you go into the class and then you discuss. And it seems it's that, I mean, the way to learn reading is it's important somehow. So just. We, we did a survey of students at my university 15 years ago, probably about how they use the textbook. And we discovered that about a third of students will at least look at the book before class. They may not read the whole chapter completely, but they'll look at, they'll, they'll look at some of the examples. Maybe well, they always go to the, the chapter summary because they hope that if they just read the summary, that'll be enough. And then another third of the students would read the, 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 the textbook fairly closely, but not until after class. Um, and then a third of the students essentially just never use their textbook at all. They, they, they think that the professor will tell them in class everything that they need to know and that then that they just spend a large amount of money on this book, but they never actually use it. <clears throat> now, it's, it's certainly true that for active learning, you would like students to come to class with some kind of preparation, ideally to have read the chapter. Uh, that's really hard to do, although there are some ways you can help with that. But, but one way to do so is to give a reading quiz. Um, I don't know, are, are, are you using Pearson's Mastering Physics? No, I mean, that's another question I'd like to ask you afterwards, because I mean, we don't have it in Portuguese. So I mean, it's, I also would like to, do you think it's, I mean, my other question would be, do you think it's using Mastering Physics makes a difference? Because like, I'm trying to use the pre instruction. I do my reading tests that is using the Google form. They shouldn't have to do it before classes. But I guess that master of physics has much more tools to work, and I'd like to also yeah. to know if you think well, it's. Let, 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 let me come back to that. The, but you know, on mastering physics, there are reading quizzes for every chapter, and I, I wrote them myself. Uh, and they're they're fairly basic questions, and they're not meant to test mastery because you test mastery afterwards. You, you, we just like to have enough questions that students probably cannot answer them unless they've at least at least somewhat read the chapter, but they should be easy once they've read the chapter. And so it's an incentive for them to read the chapter before class. So that's one way to do things. <clears throat> a, a lot of professors now that teach with active learning have some kind of video that they want students to watch before class. Uh, often these are videos they've made themselves uh, of kind of doing the lecture beforehand. I have to say that of the ones I've seen, uh, a lot of them are very bad. And if I were a student, I wouldn't want to watch them because you know they, it's, they're not very good quality. Uh, it's just the kind of the professor droning on and on, and it's not nearly as interesting to watch it on a video as it would have been in class and so on. But it's possible. If you're going to make videos though, don't do your entire lecture. Student attention span for watching videos is about eight to 10 minutes. 
uh, and, and they, you, you, you've lost them if you go more than about 10 minutes. So, so you need to just, if you're going to make your own videos, think about, you know, how can I make an eight or 10 minute, you know, summary of the, of the, of the essential points uh, and not try to do an entire lecture on, on the video. Uh, again, kind of going back to mastering physics, though, I'm working right now making pre-lecture videos. Uh, not of me, they're, they're anim I, I narrate them, but they're animated. And it's kind of like an animated PowerPoint slides, but using a lot of more real animation that I can program in JavaScript. So I'm, I'm working on waves right now. So, so if you try to use the book, you know, pictures of waves are just static images. They don't move. If you try to draw a picture of a wave on the board in class, and you know, again, it's just a static image of a wave. But in an animated lecture, I can make the waves move. I can make them interfere. I can show beats. Uh, all the different kind of wave things can be done with fairly simple JavaScript animations. And so I'm making a whole series of pre-lecture videos that should be available next fall on mastering physics uh, that, that will be very, very useful for the type of people who, who want to have students do something before they come to class in order to be more active in class. As for mastering physics itself, uh, I should say I, 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 I work with mastering physics because they're the presenters of, of a lot of content, but I don't really have any direct stake in mastering physics. It, it really it, it doesn't affect me one way or the other, whether it's people who are using my book use mastering physics or not. It's an additional expense for their students. Uh, I, though, personally think it's very, very good uh, because you can get things like pre-lecture videos, reading quizzes, things like that, that you maybe could do yourself, but it takes a lot of time. And they're already done for you, uh, if you if you use them on mastering physics. Uh, in terms of homework, mastering physics has, in addition to the, all the homework problems that are in from the book, uh, what they call tutorials, which have a lot of hints in them. And one of the things I talked about was this idea of deliberate practice in scaffolding, where you can start out with providing students with lots of hints. And that's what the, the tutorials do. They have lots and lots of hints. Uh, and so students get a chance to work through a problem and, and get lots of hints along the way before they go to more standard problems where they don't have the hints. And then the other thing about mastering physics is the idea that I also mentioned of immediate feedback. They know it instantly if it was right or wrong. And, and you can set as the instructor how many attempts they get. You, you can give them unlimited attempts if you want to, although most students won't try it an unlimited number of times. Uh, most instructors, the, I think the default, which most instructors go with, is students get five attempts. And they get a, a few less points every time. So if you get the first the answer right on the first try, you get 100%. If you get it right on the second try, you get 90%, and so on down. Maybe you only get 50% credit if it takes, takes you all five attempts. And you might think, well, if they didn't know how to do it on the first try, then what's going to be different <clears throat> on a second try or a third try? But you, 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 you can, as an instructor, you can download all the statistics. And you can see that, actually, that students who don't get it correct on the first try very frequently do on the second or third or fourth try. So they are continuing to go back and look at this and going, well, what was wrong? And, and trying again until they eventually do get it right. And if you do a standard problem where you collect the homework and grade it by hand, they never get that chance. They, they get one chance. If it's wrong, they never get to think about it again. And by the time you return the home, homework to them, they'll have forgotten what the problem was. So any, any feedback is, is kind of irrelevant. So I think there's a lot of really, really good things about using mastering physics. Uh, it takes a lot of grading off of your hands, uh, so it helps you time-wise, but it, it is an extra expense to students, and you have to dis discover, you know, for yourselves whether you can justify that extra expense. Okay, thank you again. Um, now, Isa is a question. Uh, thank you, Professor Randall, for your lecture. Uh, I work with teacher formation for high school, and I have been practicing most of the strategies you presented, 
and I agree and I observe that the students uh, get much more involved with the disciplines when they interact themselves, even in the remote uh, way of uh, teaching. And I'd like to hear you, uh, your opinion about the use of uh, simulators and other technologies, even in high school, uh, working with the alternative conceptions and uh, I would say the pedagogical knowledge of the contents that we work in high school and in the future in basic physics in the university. I, I think technology could be very, very helpful. Now, I will have to say that because I retired from teaching several years ago, I've, I've, I've not been able to, as we're all doing now during the pandemic of, of teaching remotely. So I have no experience with how that has worked out. Uh, it's been, been a difficult transition for many, but now after two years, I think many people who are teaching remotely are getting pretty good at it. Uh, but simulations, other technology, I think can be very, very helpful. Um, if you're familiar with the, the FET simulations from the University of Colorado, uh, those are very yeah. well done. Uh, and, and I highly recommend those because they've spent a lot of time thinking about how do you make them effective? Um, many of us, of course, have probably made little simulations of, you know, solving Newton's second law in a numerical way to, to, to make an object move or something like that. And we think, oh, well, I'll, I'll assign that to my student and have my student you know, do that because you can do it, do it in, in spreadsheets even uh, with a very simple integration techniques. Uh, those are not necessarily so effective. Students get focused on the details of, you know, how do I make it work? But and are not thinking about the physics of why does it work? Uh, or, or alternatives of, of, of changing the parameters and seeing how things are different. So one of the nice things about the FETs is students don't have to make it work. They just have to focus on, you know, why do things happen the way they do? And it's very easy to change things and you can ask them more conceptual questions. So I would say, you know, if the introductory, you know, eventually, of course, we want students to be able to, to code and program and things like that. But that's, that's a more advanced topic. At the introductory level, I wouldn't worry so much about having students make their own coding or, or anything like that, but, but, but find some quality simulations where they can basically use it like a laboratory of saying, you know, what, what happens if I change this? What happens if I change that? And I, I think what they've also found at Colorado is give them some open-ended questions. Don't, don't give them a cookbook. Because sometimes when we use simulations, we try to give them too many instructions. We'll say, you know, do this, do this, do this, do this. And then once again, they, they get so focused on just trying to follow all the instructions that they're not thinking about what's going on. So the it, simulations tend to work better if you just give them an open-ended question and then let them play with the simulation however they want to, to try to answer that question. Uh, thank you for your comments. All right, so we have a student now eager, please. Hello, um, Mr. Randall, um, I would like to ask your opinion about summer classes during vacations. And here we have like one, two months of classes in which we kind of turn a semester into like really, really short period of time. And I'd like to know if you think that that's productive or bad for the students, because it's like really intense. We learn a lot, but I had that experience. I loved it, but I think that sometimes um, I didn't learn as much as I could if I would do like a complete semester during the year. And I would like to know your opinion. Well, that's interesting. I'm, I don't know that I really have much of an opinion. I've, I've never taught a class like that. Um, and I'm not really aware of any research that would bear on it. 
other than, you know, these many physics concepts are, are not easy and they, they take some time. And so sometimes, you know, if, if, if you rush, you, I mean, yes, if, if you focus on doing physics for five hours a day, you, you can cover an entire semester in, in three weeks or something like that. But it doesn't have time for the concepts to kind of grow in your mind and, and become more established ideas. So, so I, I would think, you know, really good students, this might work very well for some bit more more average students. It, it might just be too rushed. It doesn't give time for the for the thoughts to really kind of consolidate in your mind. All right. Okay, thank now, you. So Daniel. Hello, Professor Knight. Thanks for the uh, very nice presentation. Um, so two questions, uh, one in, along the lines that uh, Igya has just asked, but more focusing on the normal physics course. So one thing that tends to be a consensus here, I think, is that the students, uh, most students, especially the non-physics non, uh, track students, like the engineering students or other disciplines, have extremely crowded um, schedules both uh, within the university and, and other activities that they, they do, they work, they so, so on. So there's, there tends to be a feeling that the, 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 what, the things you suggested, like repeating lots of exercises and, and, and hammering it until they get it, until so they get it, kind of removing the scaffolding and so on, they just don't have time to do that for the, for the entirety of the subject matter that is covered in the, in the, in the, the usual semester. So they end up rushing. So the question is, do you think it would be productive to have a leaner um, curriculum, even if we leave out things that are traditionally we as physicists think that are important, but maybe for the students, they would profit more from having fewer subjects covered in a, in a physics course, even if they don't have such a, a, as, as thorough a, a, an education as we would have liked. And my second question, sorry, quickly, is a, a more practical one, which is, well, not more commercial one, let's say. So your textbook is, I believe, in the fourth edition in the USA, and it's has stopped in the second edition here in Brazil. Do you have any idea if there is any chance that it will be updated here too? Well, let me answer your second question first. Ashley, the, the fifth edition just came out in the last spring in, in the US. Um, and yes, I think it's the second edition that was translated into Portuguese. Uh, we don't have any control over translations of editions. You know, somebody in the host country decides they want to translate the book and they contact Pearson and say, I'd like to translate the book. And uh, they come up with some kind of contract and for, for, for making that happen. So in, in, unless somebody in Brazil or, or in Portugal decides that they want to translate a more, more recent edition, then it, that it won't happen. So, so somebody there has to take the initiative to make that happen. So I, I, I was kind of surprised to see it a few years ago when it was translated into Portuguese for the second edition, because I had not been told that this was even happening. I just one, one day I got a package in the mail and, and I, so they, they sent me a copy of the Portuguese edition. And I'm going, I didn't even know they were doing this. So uh, again, yeah, it's, Maybe, maybe if you have a you know an education student or something like that looking for a project that might make a little little money on the side, you might say, hey, would you like to translate a more, a more recent edition? Um, and, and, and doing a more recent edition, of course, would be much easier because a lot of it hasn't changed, and so you would would wouldn't have to necessarily retranslate every single paragraph. But 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 that that's how the translations work. Uh, as far as how much do you cover? Yes, you're right. You know, students are very pressed for time. We would like to think that you know physics is by far their highest priority, but it's not, uh, except for maybe a few physics majors that are in the class. I mean, most of the students that are in the class are engineers or they're chemistry majors, and physics is not their highest priority, uh, and they don't spend as much time on it as as we would like. And so we we have to you know realize that you know how, how can we maximize our gains un, under that kind of set of constraints. I, I've long advocated for teaching less topics. We, 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 we have a, feel that we have a compulsion to uh, 
race through a tremendous amount of material. And then we complain, well, the students did very poorly on the final exam, they didn't learn it. Well, if, if they didn't learn it, what was the point of trying to cover so many topics? Uh, if, if we can you know, scale back somewhat on the topics and, and then decide, it, but, but give them more time on each so that they actually have some real learning, that, that you know, overall, that's probably a net gain. Now, again, that's, that's not without constraints because there's some expectation, not only by engineers, but even you know, physics instructors for more advanced topics of you know, what will they bring into the course with them from their introductory physics. But I think in most cases, if, if you talk to your colleagues that teach engineering, you'll discover that we teach all kinds of things that they don't really care whether students learned or not, because the, the, the introductory engineering courses in mechanics and circuits and thermodynamics, they pretty much start from the beginning anyway. R really what engineering faculty want from physics for the most part is for students to have learned some problem solving skills, not any spe spe special content knowledge. So if, if you can teach less content, but have them master it better and, and learn some good problem solving skills, your engineering colleagues will probably be perfectly happy. And then again, you know, in terms of more advanced physics courses, you just have to, you know, decide, you know, how to divide up material. Should I try to force all this into the intro class or would I be happy delaying some of it and picking it up when I get to a, a, an upper division class? So, so would you advocate uh, separating physics majors and engineering ma majors on in most, introductory courses? Yeah, most universities don't have enough physics majors to separate them. <laughs> uh, a, a typical university in the, in, in the United States might have five physics majors. And you're, you're not going to devote an entire faculty member to teaching a freshman class with five students in it. Uh, you know, MIT. Caltech, you know, a few places like that have enough physics majors that they can have their own special class, but that's very much the exception. There's very, very few universities in the U.S. that have enough physics majors that you could do that. Um, I don't know what your situation is, but, you know, if, if, if you do, I, I think you can make a strong case for having a separate class for the physics majors, but you, you have to convince the administration that that's a good, good use of your resources. That's interesting. So I, I, I see a question here uh, on the chat. So uh, I have, a, it's from Felipe Barretos. It says, I have a question about multidisciplinary uh, as a way to teach physics related to other science subjects. So how about creating multidisciplinary labs, uh, institutes and class to teach deep physics through a bigger picture of cause and effect in nature? Um. In general, I you know, being more multidisciplinary, I think, is a good idea. It runs into the same problems, though, if you try to actually do this, that, that you, you run into if you ask professors, you know, would you be willing to change the order that, that we teach topics in? Is that pe people have, professors have habits, you know, I want to do it this way and not any other way. And so even if they say, well, you know, suppose we taught physics and chemistry and math all together as one big multidisciplinary course, they might say, oh, that's a great idea, but I'm not going to do it. Uh, so because that's not the way I teach. So, so a lot of these things, they're, they're institutional issues, not so much science issues or pedagogy issues. It's just that institutions have a long history of the way they do things, and it's very difficult for institutions to change. I, I saw you have you have a book right for, for biology students perhaps or uh, we just came out with a new, new new book this past spring called University Physics for the Life Sciences. Mm -hmm. The I have two co-authors on that. The mm -hmm. there was there's been an interest in the United States over the last you know, 10, 15 years in teaching biology students and students who are going to become doctors, pre-medical students, physics that's more relevant to them. Because the, the typical course that they take, which often is not a calculus course, just uses algebra, is really almost the same course, just with less math that we teach the engineers. But that's not really the physics that you need if you're going to be a biologist or especially if you're going to be a doctor. 
I mean, some of it is that the key ideas are the same, but all the applications are so different. And even some of the topics are different. For example, one of the most critical things that doctors and, and biologists deal with all the time is diffusion. And we generally don't teach diffusion at all in an introductory class for engineers and physicists. It might be mentioned, but, but it's not a big topic. Uh, and another area is energy. I mean, what could be more fundamental to, to, to living systems than energy? But biologists and doctors talk about energy in a very, very different way than physicists do. The, by far the most important idea in biology for understanding how energy works is free energy because systems have to minimize their free energy. And in physics, we talk, we, we generally focus on these idealized cases of closed systems. Nothing's a closed system in biology. Everything's exchanging energies, exchanging matter. So the way that we deal with energy in thermodynamics and physics is totally mismatched to how it's used in biology. So in, in, in coming up with this book for Physics for the Life Sciences, we really tried to, to reconceptualize a lot of topics uh, and, and say, you know, can we make this relevant so that biologists and doctors will actually find this useful in their own professional practice and not simply a requirement that they have to take a physics class? So uh, it just, it's just being used for the first time this year. So I don't, don't have much feedback yet on, on how it's working out. But uh, if, if, you, if you teach a lot of biology and, and, and pre-medical students of a physics class, you might want to take a look at it. All right. Do you have any more questions? I, I may have a last question, perhaps. Uh, you mentioned these uh, inter interactive lecture demonstrations. Mm -hmm. Did you have some example, concrete examples? Uh, well, example I always like to, to talk about is about Newton's third law. So, Remember, you know, students have their own version of Newton's third law, that the big object always wins. Uh, and so if you ask students, you know, the, 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 the mosquito and the, and the car windshield are going to collide. And 85, 90% of students will usually tell you, well, the force of the car on the mosquito is obviously much bigger than the force of the mosquito on the car. And you can do this as a demonstration if you have force probes and, 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 and air carts or air carts on a track or something like that. And you put a force cart probe on, on the front of each of them, put, make them different masses and run them together and, and watch the forces. And if you, add, if you do this in an in interactive lecture mode, you first ask students you know, to tell them what you're gonna do. I'm gonna, I've got these forces. You might be probably even test a force probe first, show what it measures. Um, and so, so, I, so I, 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 can, I can see how big the force is. It's gonna be a pulse during collision. I can see how big the pulse is going to be. And I'm going to, you know, run these together. And this card, I'm going to put a whole bunch of weights on, so it's very heavy, and predict what the outcome is going to be. And you know, again, you know, almost all students will predict that the heavier cart will make a bigger force on the lighter one, than vice versa. And then do the experiment, and what do you discover? The forces are exactly the same. And students don't believe it; they think it was a trick. So you have to do it again. And, and, and it, 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 you can do this very fast. This only takes five minutes of class. So you can do it with one cart moving and the other cart at rest and then change them and have both of them move. Have one hit the other from behind. And every time the forces are exactly the same. And if you put a conceptual Newton's third law question on the final exam, for a month later, nearly every student will get it right. They really learn from this and they don't forget it. That's nice. And you, so so you, 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 you can make a real permanent change in student conceptual understanding in five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting. Okay, so I think, we, uh, okay, Daniel, again, please. Just in relation to that, so you mentioned it a few times and obviously you have no way of knowing the conditions here. Uh, but it's extremely hard, at least in our department, to have um, demonstrate physical, actual, real demonstrations in lecture classes for a number of reasons. Um, do you think that doing this sorts of experiments 
with a simulator is as effective or how effective do you think it is compared to a, a real physical in their face demonstration? I, the, the FET people at Colorado have done a lot of tests of using simulations as opposed to actual experiments or, or demonstrations. Uh, and they find that it's if it's a really good simulation, it can be very good. Maybe not quite as good as doing the real thing, but fairly close. But you've got to have really good simulations. Otherwise, uh, the, it's, it's, it's the, the effectiveness of this falls off quite a bit. The, but, but certainly, you know, it's one thing you can think about, you know, in terms of, you know, in, institutions change slowly. But, but if you, you, you might you know, at least think about, you know, what, what would we have to change to try to get more demonstrations into our lectures and, and, and try to you know, maybe start the process of making that kind of change. Just in addition to that, you know that students today have a much wider and deeper experience with video games than they do with actual physics. So I've, I have a feeling that if you make very detailed and realistic simulations, they'll just assume that it's programmed to do whatever it is that it's doing, and it could be anything else. So it, 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 it won't necessarily make a connection to the real world. At all. It's just like that because that's, that's the way you want it to be. No, that, that's a very good point because you can simulate things that are some other set of physical laws than, than, than the real physical laws, and students don't know the difference. So, so it's, it's true, as, and, and they've played video games where obviously people are doing things that are unphysical. So, so you, that, that is a really potential drawback to any kind of simulation is, is students don't necessarily believe that that's the real world. Yeah. I got an assistant here at the last minute. <laughs> Quite nice. Okay, I think we ran out of questions. Uh, I thank you very much, Professor Knight, for patient of staying here with 40 minutes of questions. We had a lot of people. Thank you very much. Okay, glad so much that I could, could participate. And uh, if you have any, any follow up questions, Bob, you, Rodrigo, you can certainly share my email address if people want to email me about anything. All right. All right. Thank